We just want to make a good movie. We just want to make a movie that entertains us, that I would want to see, that doesn't exclude anybody. Oh boy, this is going to be good, I can tell. I always believe in research. No matter what the subject matter is, you cannot do enough research. Because so much believability will come out of what's really there. I went on numerous field trips and, and, and uh, uh, research trips. Going to the museums to actually take fish out of the bottles and, and, and have a look at, at them close up. I went to every single person early on in the film and said, you have to get certified scuba diving, you have to go underwater. We cannot make a movie about the underwater world without you experiencing it firsthand. The design of the coral reef has been really interesting because um, we had all taken scuba lessons and gone and looked at the coral reef. It was spectacular. Just experiencing the reality of a world like that has an enormous psychological impact and an impact inevitably on the work you begin to create. People came back just with these eyes like, it was amazing. You know, I said, I told you. One of the first things I did was I got together with the R&D group and we, and we looked at images of things underwater and we thought, what is it that makes you believe that it's underwater? We put together uh, our simplest version of an underwater set, almost like my first ocean, and tried to make that look like it was underwater. Our first test appeared to be either a chlorinated swimming pool or a very foggy day on a heath somewhere in Scotland. We didn't get ocean water. Each of these individual aspects of being underwater looked great but we couldn't get them all to work in concert together. And I just picked a couple shots of things above water and things below water from real footage, and I said, okay, using exactly the tools that we have created and nothing else, I want you to see how close you can mimic these actual shots. And they came back a couple weeks later, and they put the two images up, the actual live action footage and then our footage, and I couldn't tell which one was which. We were shocked. I mean, we were elated because it's like, oh my gosh, we, we, we did it. I mean, it looks like water. Then we had to sort of pull back and go, wait a minute, it looks too real. We want you to believe that it exists, but we want you to also kind of feel that you're in a make-believe world. We just push on the story as hard as we can. And we try and buy ourselves as much time as possible to work out every aspect of the story. It's really important for us, sort of at the head of this big pipeline, before it gets down to layout and animation and lighting, to work this thing out right. And that includes pacing of a film, that includes the emotion, making sure that people are feeling things as the movie progresses. And on Nemo, Andrew thought he had the magic bullet because he wrote the screenplay himself and had a complete screenplay going into this, which we don't always do. We thought that this whole process was going to be much smoother sailing. But the reality is, is once you put these movies up in storyboard form, a lot of things come to light that aren't clear when you're just reading words on a printed page. The thing that finally makes it on the screen is all about rewrite, 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 rewrite. Is that funny enough? Make it funnier. Okay. And a good portion of the rewrite process is not done by the screenwriter, you know, at a word processor or a typewriter. It's the story department. It's the guys that sit in a room with you for close to two years, batting out ideas, countering your ideas, drawing up story panels, putting them up on a wall, pitching things, putting things on a reel down in editorial. It, it's a very malleable, messy, glorious process. Sometimes it's about doing things over and over and over and over again. And even though I've done this a lot of times, it, it never fails to 
to bring me to that point we're in. Oh boy, I don't want to do that sequence one more time. When it works, it's amazing. Uh, the power of what you can do with a group of great minds. Um, but it can also be very, very frustrating because there's not a singular mind at times. Can you help me? No. You get yourself in there, you can get yourself out. When it really got dark and we didn't know what to do, we would, Andrew Stan and I would jump in a car and we'd drive to L.A. You know, instead of flying down to go down and record Ellen DeGeneres or Albert Brooks, we'd drive six hours. But what that would force us to do is to just talk it out with no other distractions. And we worked a lot of good stuff out that way. When I watch the film now, I can remember where we were on I-5 when this idea was brought forward. In fact, the Nemo initiation sequence was written on one of these trips. Shark bait. Shark bait. Ooh ha ha. Welcome, brother shark bait. Shark bait. Ooh ha ha. We cut the boards together with dialogue, temp music, temp sound effects. It's very important that the experience of viewing the story reels for the audience going to approximate the experience of viewing the finished film. We spent a lot of time, we spent years, in fact, honing this story reel to try to create the best, most solid, entertaining template for the movie. Good what we decided to do was to uh, establish a range of underwater color to track the characters through the film. So with the reef, we start with crystal clear, kind of very light greenish turquoise. And as the film progresses, it gets darker green turquoise and then black and then blue. And then as we get closer to Sydney Harbor, it becomes greener. The pastels are used to kind of outline the color and the mood and the lighting for the entire film. Here's this morning in Pelicans. I start off again with a big broad stroke color palette. We try and figure out time of day and mode for the film. And then as we move forward and things are getting finalized in story, I go back in and you know just visit key shots in a scene to kind of provide a direction for lighting. He'll put out the inspiration for what the scene should feel like and how it fits into the whole. We'll scan them in and then she'll take them and she'll balance the colors a little bit. And he'll see it later and he's like, wow. That looks as good as I was hoping it would look, which just, of course, makes me feel like a million dollars. It was by trying to make a shot appear to be like you see when you scuba dive and you're underwater <gasps> that we came up with a whole bunch of elements that were critical to making a shot feel like it was underwater which include how it surges and swells back and forth, the particulate matter in the water itself, murk being the fall off of color, that water filters differently than air, the caustic lights, which is the light play from the surface that you see in the bottom of the swimming pool, the beams those things go through because water is so much denser than air, you can see the light shafts themselves. Okay, now how is it different being in a reef than being in deep ocean water than being murky in, the, in a harbor? Oh, okay. So now you have to find different settings for all those various things again and set the levels again so you get, you know, harbor water and sewage water and clear open blue ocean water, murky ocean water, bright sunny reef water that's shallow at night and at day and at dawn and dusk. If you look at fish, it's, it's amazing how little we did have to caricature them because they're so wild in their shapes and forms. They took a lot of scientific input but there are some things you just have to do in order to act that fish don't do. Real fish have the eyes on the side of the head. They don't have eyelids and they don't blink and they don't talk. So when, how do you design a fish that is able to talk and emote and, and everything that the animators are gonna wanna put in there? We looked at how dogs emote. The subtle movements of their eyebrows is enough to emote like sadness or happiness. Neutral. Excited. Angry. Stern. Sad. And it's the same thing with these fish designs. We put enough eyebrow mass in there to really get the nuances of emotion. So I basically now have to flesh that design out. 
start figuring out the details about the fins and the gills and the mouth and the teeth and turn her around, draw her from so many different angles. So as I'm developing that character, there are some designs that Andrew really likes, Andrew and Ralph really like, and then they give it to Jerome Ralph, the sculptor here. We're generating these sculptures to pre-visualize character design. We knock these out in clay, just like this, and we uh, do it as fast as we can so we can get as many changes from the director and the art director, as many as we need. That's really the, when the magic happens. Starting to see that 2D drawing come alive in 3D, and it's like, I get all this amazing information from it. I start seeing it in a new way. I start turning it around. I look at it from the top and the bottom because that's, you never know if that's the way they're going to be seen in the movie. Once the sculpt's done and we get approvals, then it goes on to the modelers and then they actually start building them in the computer using our clay sculpts as a reference. Then we would have animators come in and help us figure that stuff out too. So the process is incredible. It's so collaborative. Shark bait, you did it! Yeah. Shark bait, you're covered with germs! <laughs> the shader and texture art director is responsible for taking those models, both sets and characters, and giving them life in terms of the scales or textures on the surface of these characters. Tropical fish die a lot, unfortunately, and so they always have a good supply of, at fish stores of dead, dead fish. So then we'd take them and we'd slap it on the scanner and we'd hold it up to the light and see what it looked like. and start identifying what the important characteristics are of that fish. What color they are, what kind of texture they are, how they respond to light when lit. So like whether they're shiny or smooth, whether they're velvety or translucent. So you do like it, don't you? No, 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 I do, I do, I do. I really do like it. We had, I think, this bag of tricks as animators for bipedal characters. We'd all carried around with us, even you know, ever since Toy Story 1. It, it wasn't until we had done the first few tests that we had realized that it's a completely different language. I think for most animators it takes a good month or two of like pretty intense stuff to really, really get into understanding what makes a fish feel like a fish and adapting their old bag of tricks to the new bag of tricks. One thing I always equate it to is animating fish is like animating toilet paper underwater like muscular toilet paper. It's so loose and smooth everywhere, but then muscularly driven that that's a hard thing to do. One of the first lectures I gave was on how fish move. And I was sort of amazed to get called back just two days later to sort of look over some of the things that they had dummied up based on my lecture. And this fellow was showing me how the fish moved and everything. I said, they can't move their pectoral fins like that. That won't look right. A fish can't just sort of do that. He said, you know, Adam, Fish don't talk. It takes a tremendous amount of effort to create something that looks effortless. You're pushing the envelope, you're, you're, you're stressing your production plan out as much as you can to, to bang on the story and you know get the lines just right and get it edited just right. Crunch time is like almost like literal, you know? It's like you you have so much that comes right at the end because you've taken so much time to plus the story. I think when things get really tough around here and when you, you start to feel the stress build up, um, that tends to be when we kind of explode as a group and people just go crazy, you know? We tend to kind of just blow off steam or whatever. when we move to this big building is you don't see the people that you used to see all the time and <clears throat> I think that a lot of us were missing each other and missing that collaboration. 
It's called the ugly contest. Basically, all of the men have grown mustaches. The women have put eyeshadow on from their eyelids all the way up to their eyebrow. Like